It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce Ambassador Donald Steinberg, the new Deputy Administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development. It is a particular pleasure to introduce Donald Steinberg because he is also an alum of the Jennings Randolph Program. Before taking up his post as Ambassador and now um, new Deputy Steinberg was uh, Deputy President at the International Crisis Group responsible for advocacy and policy formation. In that position, he became a very powerful voice for women's rights. But I think it is as a diplomat, as a U.S. Ambassador to Angola, that he came to understand the importance of taking into account a gender perspective when we're dealing with issues of war and peace. I think we're all very lucky to have Donald Steinberg in the position of Deputy Administrator of USAID. And before we move to the next panel, why UN Security Council Resolution 1325 matters to men, we wanted to give him the opportunity to outline his vision as Deputy Administrator for the next few years. So without further ado, please join me in warmly welcoming Donald Steinberg. Thank you so much, and thanks for the opportunity to reconnect with so many friends. Uh, I have been at AID for all of about three weeks right now, so I have huge basis of knowledge and, uh, and the information to share. Uh, what I really wanted to do was to introduce uh, our panel, the next panel, and the, the topic is indeed why UN Security Council Resolution 1325 matters to men, but I wanted to use that title as a proxy for the real question in Washington, which is how do you persuade men, policymakers, negotiators, and other uh, leaders to understand that the participation and empowerment of women, especially in the context of armed conflict, post-conflict reconstruction, peace negotiations, implementation, and post-conflict governance really matters and is at the center of our interests. As advocates for this agenda have put it forward, there are a variety of different arguments that we, we have tried to use. We've used the argument of fairness and equity. Women are 50% of the population. They deserve to be at the table. Uh, women uh, are the principal victims of armed conflicts, and therefore they deserve to be at the table. We often try to use the, in effect, the legal side of this, that there is the Declaration of Human Rights, that there are uh, international conventions that assure women uh, a role in these processes. We sometimes use sort of the, what I would say, value-based argumentation. Women are inherently more peaceful women are inherently more cooperative, and they are inherently less uh, corrupt. And I actually believe all of those things. <laughs> and then sometimes we even use the personal side of this. Every man who negotiates a peace agreement had a mother. Every man, thank you. <laughs> Every man, most men have wives, most men have daughters, and we try to put it in the, the context of that. But speaking to men about these issues, the real argument that works is the argument of effectiveness. Reminding negotiators that their vaunted peace processes usually fail, and that the failure to involve women in peace negotiations, peace implementation processes as planners, as implementers, and as beneficiaries is one of the reasons that the agreements fail. And it is essential to use that effectiveness argument. In that regard, I wanted to tell you one story that's in the book that we're about to come out with at the U.S. Institute of Peace regarding my experience uh, in Angola. In 1994, I was Bill Clinton's advisor for Africa, and I helped uh, those who were negotiating the Angolan Peace Agreement that was designed to put an end to 25 years of civil war 
that had cost about a half million lives and left about four million people homeless. I remember when the agreement was signed in November of that year, doing a speech very similar to this setting, and in the Q&A, somebody raised uh, her hand and said, how does this agreement affect women who have suffered in the conflict? And I said, very proud of myself, this, there is nothing in this agreement that discriminates in any way, shape, or form against women. Uh, it is gender neutral. Well, then Bill Clinton asked me to go out to Angola uh, as the American ambassador to help implement that peace process. And it took me about three weeks to realize that a peace agreement that calls itself gender neutral is by definition discriminatory against women. And let me cite some of the examples of that. There was nothing in the peace agreement that said women had to be at the table or in the peace implementation body. And so what you had was 40 men sitting around a table trying to figure out how to implement a peace agreement that would affect the lives of the entire country and mostly women. Not only did that silence women's voices, but it meant that issues like uh, sexual violence, accountability, girls' education, uh, etc., were simply given short shrift if addressed at all. Secondly, the agreement was based on 13 separate amnesties that forgave the armed parties for anything they might have done during the conflict. There was even one amnesty that forgave you for anything you might do six months into the future. Uh, get out of jail free card, as it were. I've learned that in most of these contexts, amnesty simply means that men with guns forgive other men with guns for crimes committed against women. And in addition, these amnesties put at the heart of our entire peace effort, in effect, a void, a cancer. It said justice, rule of law, not really that important. This is an agreement all about the men with the guns. Third, we had demobilization programs where anyone who had a gun could hand it in, go into a demobilization camp and get all sorts of benefits uh, for uh, private life. The problem was that in most of these situations, women who were with the armed parties were not given guns. They were bearers, they were messengers, cooks, sex slaves, and therefore we completely ignored them. In addition, the camps themselves, as well as the IDP camps, generally were not put together with women in mind. And so we had constant difficulties as women went out to collect firewood, went out to uh, collect water outside the camps, they were threatened with rape, they were threatened with, uh, with death, and even within the camps, we had too many latrines in dimly lit areas, uh, and you literally risked your life when you went there. When we demobilized the soldiers, we sent them back with a little bit of money to their villages, but what we hadn't realized with the, was that they didn't have a role in those societies anymore. They didn't have skills, they didn't have relationships, they didn't have power, and the bottom line was that they felt disempowered, they felt embittered, and we had massive amounts of domestic violence, wife beating, murder of women, rape. It was as if the end of the formal conflict had begun a new era of pernicious violence against women. Finally, we had a situation where there were literally millions of landmines planted throughout the entire country. So we cleared those landmines off of the major roads and had all of the, or many of the IDPs and refugees go back to their homes. But what we hadn't done in many cases was to clear the fields and the schools and the wells. And so as women were sent out to do those duties, they were blowing off their legs in ridiculous proportions. You know, we weren't idiots. We, we understood what was going on in this situation, and we very quickly tried to change course. We brought out gender advisors, did empowerment programs, did human rights issues, uh, psychosocial training, 
But the bottom line was that women in that society understood that this peace agreement was not for them. This was for the men with the guns. And so as the peace agreement started to fall apart and we went out to civil society, and in particular women's groups, and said, put pressure on your political leaders to keep this on track, it failed miserably. They said, why are you coming to us now? You didn't talk to us in the earlier period. And the bottom line was that the country reverted to war for four more years of suffering and only ended with when Jonas Savimbi died in 2002. If this were an isolated case, it might be uh, acceptable. But we're seeing exactly the same phenomenon in the DRC, in Sudan, in Afghanistan, in Colombia. And you'd think we would have learned our lesson. And the hopeful element of my presentation here is that I think we are learning our lesson. And anyone who sat in the Security Council last Tuesday and heard Hillary Clinton announce our commitment seven years too late, but our commitment to develop a national action plan to implement 1325, and anyone who heard her announce $44 million worth of time-bound, accountable, accountable uh, assistance in this whole area, had to say maybe they finally get it. At AID, I'm hoping to be able to say we get it. And as I have been there for just three weeks, it's a little premature to announce, you know, major changes. But I will pledge to you that there are at least four areas that we will be focusing on with renewed vigor and renewed attention. The first is the area of empowerment. What that means is making sure in the political, economic, and social lives of countries around the world that women are in the political uh, party networks, that they have civil society groups that they're working in, that they have microenterprise, but not just microenterprise, that they're involved in the entire economic lives of the country, and then taking those provisions to scale so that they're not simply uh, one-off programs around the country. Secondly, we're going to focus on participation and protection. And that's the 1325 agenda, that's anti-trafficking, that's sexual and gender-based violence, that's the national action plan development, et cetera. Third, we're going to focus on mainstreaming. The president has announced three major initiatives at for AID and the government in development, food security, global health, climate change, we are going to make sure that women are at the center of each of those programs. And then finally, we're going to make sure we walk the walk within AID, that women within our institution are empowered to contribute fully, that women understand that this is a place where their talents are valued and where they have the full opportunity to contribute. This is a pledge that I make here three weeks into the job that the promise that we all made in October of 2000 when we passed the 1325 resolution, that that promise will be kept. Thank you for your attention. And while the panelists take their seats, uh, let me briefly explain to you why we thought it important to organize this panel. Um, whether it's in New York or in D.C., discussions about 1325 are often discussions between and among women. Uh, but it has been stressed, I think, the last week, as well as this week in D.C., that uh, we need to engage men in this discussion. And we believe that the best way to engage men in this discussion is to let them talk as well. <laughs> the panel before you is composed of ordinary men who each in their own way became champions of women's rights and thereby became trailblazers and hence not so ordinary anymore. I would also like to thank on behalf of all our partners, Frank Sesno, the director of the School of Media and Public Affairs at the George Washington University for accepting to moderate this panel. Frank, as a former war correspondent, immediately knew what we were talking about 
And he himself is one of those trailblazers. So with that, Frank, it's all yours. Well, well thank you very much. And uh, we really uh, appreciate the introduction. And it's, uh, yes, we're all, in case you hadn't noticed, we're all men here. So um, cigars are not allowed and not necessary for this conversation. Um, it's a great privilege to be here and to be able to participate and facilitate this conversation because, as mentioned, um, I, I have had, um, and it's an odd thing to say, the privilege, but uh, it is a privilege uh, to travel the world and to see um, some of our darkest places and some of our darkest moments as a, as, as a, as a species and to be able to shine the light on um, a part of that conversation and the half of humanity that is too often disempowered and um, disengaged from this process, which is what this UN resolution and what this discussion here today is meant to address, um, is both important uh, and a privilege. Um, let me introduce the, the guests. Uh, I will give uh, brief introductions because they, are, they exist in more uh, detail in, in, in your handouts. But Ambassador Steve Siner is the uh, former senior advisor for the Office of Global Women's Issues at the Department of State and has great experience, as you will hear in the course of our conversation, in, uh, in key areas around the world that have led him uh, to his involvement in this issue. Uh, Joost Hennen, Honen? Okay. He's a gender expert, and he uh, works at the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs um, with the Netherlands. A uh, special area of interest uh, is Afghanistan uh, at the current time. Jok Madud Jok is the Jennings Randolph Senior Fellow now, uh, the United States Institute of Peace, and Ambassador Steve Steiner, you, uh, you met and you've heard from. Uh, so, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Steinberg. Steiner, Steinberg. Oh, the yeah, I know. <laughs> Guys. Um, I'd like to start, though, by, by uh, asking each of you um, how you came to this issue set, how you came to um, care and devote yourselves so much uh, in terms of the uh, uh, protection, awareness, um, and concern for gender issues. Perhaps you'd like to start. Okay. Thank you, Frank. Uh, and thank all of you for being here. It's good to see all the support for this cause. Yes. I did not really have an aha moment like Don did, uh, his story about Angola, which is very dramatic. Um, mine was a little bit more gradual in that I was a foreign service officer for 36 years. I was an old Soviet and Russian <clears throat> hand, and because of that, my last 14 years in the foreign service were involved in nuclear arms negotiations, the old INF and START treaties. And toward the end of that, I wanted something new to do intellectually. I wanted to retire from the foreign service, and I wanted to do democracy work because just as I once <coughs> felt that nuclear arms issues go to the heart of our national security, I had come also to the conclusion, so does democracy work uh, around the world. And I wanted to be part of that. I wanted to do that for my next career. And I talked to Paula Dobriansky, who was then Under Secretary for Democracy and Global Affairs, said, I want to come do democracy work with you, and then go out to the NGO world and work in your world, so many of you. And so I went with Paula. I worked on the community of democracies, a global democracy process, and on helping to set up the Millennium Challenge account. And it just was natural that women's empowerment has to be part of this. There's no democracy if half of a population is disenfranchised. There's no democracy if half a population can't be economically enfranchised as well as politically uh, able to have leadership jobs in both areas. So it was crucial to us as we set up the Millennium Challenge account. It was crucial to us in community democracy work. I retired again a second time about a year and a half after that, but never got to the NGO world because I was called to come back to state. They'd got $10 million in reprogrammed money from the old CPA in Iraq to set up a democracy training program for Iraqi women. And in 2004, I came back in after a very brief retirement and started up that program. And from there on in, I was hooked. <laughs> I'm a believer, and it's not women's issues. These are issues for all of us. These are national security issues. You were also working uh, extensively on issues related to traffic, human trafficking. Yes, right? I spent time uh, dealing with uh, our efforts to combat human trafficking. And also I've been very involved lately in working on uh, support for women in Afghanistan. So well, clearly the trafficking issues must have driven 
this attention repeatedly because disproportionately that falls uh, on, on women, does it not? Yes, it does, although I was also involved on the labor side of human trafficking, which involves a lot of forced labor of men and children. So I, I worked that part. But I'd already become a believer in this earlier, Frank, because uh, of the work on democracy before I did the work in combating trafficking. The work on democracy showed me this is the only way to go. Yes, you have an interesting journey yourself. Yeah, I, I, I think that my case started already when I was a, was a young boy, uh, looking at my parents, uh, when, how they received and answers to questions from people who came to our farm uh, from the government with questions on, on how the household was, was led and organized. And um, each time my mother would say on a question, is who's, the, who's in charge in the family? She would say, that's, of course, that's, that's my husband. And my father would say, yes, that's me. And, and I, at, at the first time I heard that, I, I almost burst out in laughter. <laughs> because for me, at, at the age of seven, my mother was the boss. And uh, it, it was a strong, I mean, my father was a village council member for 30 years, but for each meeting they had, my mother would go through the agenda with him. <laughs> and I'd like to meet your mother. I would yeah. like that. <laughs> and, and tell him what the results should be for each point and also what he should say if, if Mr. So-and-so came up with that argument, then this is the, the answer to it. And then uh, my father went out with his cigar and his suit, and uh, of course he talked in the meeting the way exactly my mother had instructed him. <laughs> uh, and later he would come back and he had to what we call now debrief. <laughs> And, and, and my God, my, my father was in trouble the moment he didn't perform the my, uh, my mother wanted him to, to do. My second, I mean, from that onwards, I, I developed also a sense of perceptions. I mean, we think that we know what's going on in, on household levels between men and women, but sometimes it's different. And when I was a student, I, in fact, I went back to my village and I asked all the other village council members how... Is it in your families? And I mean, uh, I think 80% had the same experience, that the women were organizing the decisions in, in the background. If I say it is in Africa, I mean, many times it's hilarious because it's something which they, they experience also. They actually acknowledge it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, my... To, to keep it short, I mean, my, my most, I mean, that's, that's the issue of gender or the issue of women as leaders or informal leaders sometimes. And, of course, we should aspire for women as, as formal leaders. But the issue of uh, women in peace and security issues came when I was uh, a young, uh, ambitious, I would say, uh, country director for one of the Dutch uh, NGOs. And I was asked to restart the program of three Dutch NGOs in Rwanda in 95, one year after the genocide. And um, I had a colleague, a lady, who was on her own right. She was the chair of the uh, Rwandan uh, Women's Network, Réseau des Femmes. And she showed me the whole country. And um, there were two things which, which struck my mind. One is that uh, the issue of, of orphans and uh, we did all kinds of programs for them, but, but sitting next to children who have lost their parents and uh, their brothers and sisters, and when you do something, they, I, they, they needed warmth. And I had children of the same age, and that struck me very much. The second was that at the end, uh, my colleague, she asked me whether I could moderate a workshop for the Women's Network to develop their new strategic plan. And of course we organize it in a way uh, we always do with a short introduction uh, and then uh, we do a, a general presentation, we do uh, breakouts in smaller groups, we come back, etc. But when I saw this group, it were, there were about 80 women from all over the country, I realized quickly that you can't do it like that. So I said let's just talk let the women talk amongst them for the first day. Because all of them had lost 
the majority of the families who were all victims of this victims uh, they had been raped or whatever um, they had lost their colleague women in the in the women's network so there was a lot of emotion and uh, I thought my god now my program is gone because I mean I had the three day program and the first day was gone I, th I thought let's see where we get but the the thing which struck me was that the next morning everybody started and there was such an energy to get things done. And I think it, it has been said many times today and yesterday, uh, uh, women are victims, but they know they have an energy to get over it and move on. And uh, I mean, we talk always about 50%, but at that time, uh, the, the, there were women were 65% of the population. 65%. And, uh, I mean, we don't talk about half the population. We talk in, in fragile states, it's always the majority. It's between 52 and 60, 65%. And, uh, yeah, th let, let me stop here. So, uh, but before you stop, you are now the gender division of the Department of Human Rights, Gender, and Good Governance, correct? Yeah. At, uh, uh, and you, you, you are the coordinator on women, peace, and security. Yeah. So your responsibilities include what? My, my, I mean, I, I'm supposed to, to advise the ministry and, in fact, the minister and, and the, the top management of the ministry on issues of women, peace, and security with a focus on, on countries like Afghanistan, Burundi, the DRC, no, not the DRC, the Sudan, and, and uh, some other countries like Pakistan, Yemen. We'll come back to yeah. Afghanistan yeah. and some of the countries specific, but this is part of the national yeah. action plan, yeah. correct? The and, and my second uh, institutional uh, um, focus is, is the NATO. Okay. Yep. How are you? I'm all right. Thank this you. This is good. Now, this is very interesting. You're one of six boys. Is that right in your family? Yes. Um, but you, you describe yourself as perhaps Africa's first male feminist. <laughs> Not first, but one of few. One of a few. Okay. <laughs> How'd you get there? Well, like, like, like Joseph, I think there are three stages in my uh, development into uh, someone who focuses on gender and feminist uh, explanations of the lopsided relationship between men and women. The first is, of course, uh, from growing up in, in such a patriarchal family uh, and a society where um, my family being made up of seven men and one woman in a, a strictly gender specific division of labor where most of what happened around the house was done by that single woman to serve seven men. And that um, brought a lot of questions to me. How? Do, brought how? Well, I mean, what was your frame of reference for the questions to even occur to you? Um, well, I took pity on my mother. <laughs> uh, because every single day we will go to the farm we will take care of the cattle. We will do everything that needs to be done around the, uh, the farm. But then she continues to pound the grain, to go to the market, to get the firewood, to go to the, 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 uh, the water from the well, to milk the cows. By the time people eat in the evening, she has been up for 12 hours, day in, day out, for ent her entire life. So I had to ask questions about <coughs> why can't we help her with some things. But we were socialized to be men. <coughs> and there are certain things men don't do. And, um, but because she's the only one, she has no daughters to help her around the house, I took pity on her and I began to do some of this women's work. And I became quite brilliant at it, in fact, uh, at pounding grain and carrying water on my head without holding it, uh, the sort of thing that... <laughs> um, so good at it that uh, my grandmother said, that, said to, to my mother that actually your boy was intended to be a girl, <laughs> God called him back at the exit <laughs> and gave him a penis. <laughs> you may be way ahead of us. <laughs> how, so, how am I supposed to follow this? You're not going to follow this. <laughs> 
No. So, but, this but, is in Sudan, right? You're growing Sudan. up in Sudan. So, actually, but doing women's work and being so good at it was to the detriment of my reputation mm. among my male peers. And I became a sissy. Among, among your, your my, uh, my, other my, my kids? My brothers and, and my cousins. In your family as in well? In my own family. Even my father chastised my mother for turning me into a girl. <coughs> and the moment came when my mother called me aside and said, nonsense, you are actually a better man knowing what women have to do. Oh. There was no more teachable moment than that. How old were you when that happened? Do you remember? Mm. Nine, ten. But this took courage. This must have taken courage for a little kid to be enduring that kind of criticism. And were you were you ostracized? Were you isolated by other? Boys? A lot of times, yes. I, I was quiet. I was not uh, one of these uh, guys that was always seeking a center of attention, and therefore I was uh, somewhat isolated and and spending a lot of time with my mother, and uh, and and. I learned a lot of things that came to be very, very crucial in my life when I left home as a young boy to go to university uh, outside the country at an age where most people still stayed at home and still to be served. But now I was on my own, having to look after myself. That came handy, that, 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 that training. So how did you connect this early experience, and how did that develop well, through your, career, your academic and career interests? Two other moments then happened. When I was in university, I began to be exposed to uh, theoretical explanations for the gender differences, the feminist theories, which then contextualized my experience in my family and made, and made all that experience make sense to me in the fact that one of the main theoretical explanations from the fem feminist perspective about why the situation is, it is, is the way it is, is, is the issue of socialization. We all get socialized in our own respective uh, societies into men and into women. And because of that socialization, it affects us all when we grow up. For example, one of the things that I used to hear growing up was this idea that um, boys can, can only do certain things, and girls are not supposed to do. For example, my cousins, my female cousins were told they cannot play soccer, they cannot climb trees, they cannot go hunting, because you don't have a penis. They would say that. So if you are a child growing up being told you cannot engage in play, just like other children, because you don't have the organ, of course you are going to wish you had one. <laughs> right? So, so, so that theoretical explanation made, made that life all make sense to me. There was a third uh, stage in my um, uh, coming of age in, in, this, in this field, and that is going back to Sudan in the middle of the war in the 90s to do field work. And I lived in war in 1994, 1995, and 96, during which I began to talk to women who, uh, and, and I began to understand women's uh, experience with war. Uh, one of the things that men were always saying was that all, the, all these horrors that are happening to women, the rape and the assaults and, and all of this, is a result of the madness of war. But when I was talking to women, they said that no, it is not just about the madness of war. It's because the madness of war itself builds on things that were already pre-existing, that are ingrained within the culture, that consider women mere appendages to men. That is why the war affects women more. It's because of the cultural practices that are rooted in people's uh, everyday lives. And I think that is the moment where I would... Uh, that, that would have been the aha moment, as Americans would say, uh, where I said, finally I understand why women are always targeted, why women are always more victims of war. And it is because in the Sudanese society and a lot of African societies... Women carry the honor of the society on their shoulders. If something dishonorable happens to a woman, she dishonors the entire society. It's not the same for men. It's a single man who is dishonored. But when it is a woman, it's her entire family, it is in the entire tribe that is been dishonored. So now combatants began to, re to see this as a way to bring women into being part of the world. The, because of that issue of honor, uh, an army might attack 
the women of the other side, of the opposing side, as the way to dishonor them, as the way to humiliate them. Whereas, the people on this side also think that because the war is happening and so many people are dying and so many women are dying and so many children are dying because of the impact of war, perhaps women should be considered, should be pushed to contribute to the struggle. In the part of South Sudan where I come from, women became part and parcel of the revolution. But not in terms of combat, but in terms of being expected to uphold the reproductive front, as it was called. They were supposed to contribute to the revolution by maximizing their reproductive efforts. By having babies. By having babies. Which means then, it is usually translated as giving men the right to, to, to take sex whenever. Because they have been given a license to, to expose women to as much chance as possible to be pregnant. Let me, let me bring the ambassador and, and others in and ask you to comment on some of the fascinating things. I mean, this is... This, this, this notion of socialization and, and what the socializing elements are. Um, how, when you think about what you're going to try to do to, to reorganize right. internally, do you take into account and match that up with the need to recognize and reorganize externally to take into some of these facts, take into account some of these facts? Well, one of, I wanted to, to briefly respond to the initial question, and I think it relates as well because. Sure. There is a presupposition that many of us make that our society ingrains in us these sexist roles. And in my case, it just was never ingrained. I had parents who uh, were, were very sensitive to these issues. I, had, I was a child of the 60s, my hair at present notwithstanding. Uh, <laughs> I went, I went to, to Reed College, which was the, you know, the single most radical school in the country. And I will always remember Shirley Chisholm coming to our university and saying that she had always in her life felt more discrimination for her being a woman than for her being black. And that started a whole set of thinking about these issues. I was a member of the National Organization of Women from the age of 18. And so I, I'm sort of... Why did, you, why did you join now? What, what, what prompted you to do that? Because it was the only group that was calling for equal uh, rights for women. Uh, I was strongly... I worked for the ERA amendment. Uh, we still should pass it. Uh, although that's not a position of this administration necessarily. Uh, Got to protect my three weeks of tenure. Uh, uh, so, so indeed, I mean, there are people who are predisposed to look at this. And I guess a couple of moments I also wanted to stress. I was in South Africa from 1990 to 1993 at that very exciting time when we were moving from apartheid to non-racial democracy. And the ANC recognized the power of women, and it wasn't rhetoric, and they empowered people throughout their whole system. And you just watched it, and you said, my goodness, you know, they get it. They're using 100% of the population. They cannot afford in that environment to go back to old patterns. I also wanted to say that when I, when I was telling the story about Angola, at a key moment in that process, and I, I really want to stress this for the civil society groups that are here, a number of American NGOs came out and took us aside in a very quiet way and said, you're screwing up. The Women's Refugee Commission under the remarkable Mary Diaz at that point came out, looked at what we were doing, sat me down as ambassador and said, here are six things you're not doing. Uh, you know, we can blast you publicly or we can tell you very what quietly. Were some, what were some of the six? I'm just uh, you're, you're treating women as victims. Uh, you're not uh, empowering them. You are not even talking to them as you put these programs together. And she said to me, remember the adage, nothing about us without us. And, in fact, that has pretty much stayed in my mind throughout of this. You're not empowering individual groups in civil society 
to do the relief and recovery effort, you're, you're focusing on man well-established organizations, but you're never going to have as, as much money in a post-reconstruction period as you do in that emergency period, so use those resources in that way to empower women's organizations to actually do the work. And, you know, Human Rights Watch came out, did the same thing. A remarkable NGO called PACT came out, told us the same thing. And to do it in that manner, as opposed to just, you know, they don't get it, public announcements, nasty reports, was exactly what was needed. So and, and we learned. So let me ask you now, as, as you've all explored and explained a bit how you've been brought here, and they're all... Powerful experiences, powerful experiences. Uh, when, when you hear the, the, this fascinating and, and really trailblazing story of um, confronting the, the, this, this powerful societal norm and challenging, I'm very curious, A, as to what your reaction is from your own experiences, and B, how that gets incorporated in these national policies and these priorities that 1325 envisions, because this does not happen in a vacuum. Yeah. No. They're very brave. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, when, when, I mean, the Dutch have a national action plan. I mean, we're one of the, the first, I would say. And um, we, we have gone through a process of uh, bringing together not only government, but also civil society and knowledge institutes. Um, and have them sign, actually, about a th close to 30 organizations, institutions, uh, an agreement to work together on this issue. And, uh, I mean, down the line, I mean, it's easy to sign something, but it's, it's uh, of course, more difficult to implement, uh, especially when you have a, have a group of uh, stakeholders. But the importance is, is that uh, a large group can bring in different perspectives different points of view, uh, different language. And uh, by the fact that you sign something, you, you are obliged to talk and communicate and consult. And um, that's one level, let's say at the Dutch level. But the most important one is, is that, and that evolved gradually, is that we should allow uh, the women's movement in the respective countries to talk. And we can't decide and invent all the goodies uh, we should bring them. You, you, were, you were telling me over lunch, though, for example, yeah. just as an example of this, that, you're, that you were concerned about your, your ch the challenges that you would face in Afghanistan yeah. because of some of these issues. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, again, a, a very special experience is when I started in 2008 with this job, I got the Afghanistan file. And I've, although I've worked with and very pleasantly worked with, let's say, all the women's movement in Africa, but also in, in Yemen, and in countries like Sri Lanka, uh, I thought, my God, what should I as a man do over there? And uh, because my perception, I mean, again, the perception is that you can't talk to these women because then you bring them in trouble. Uh, you, can't, um, you can't do anything. Um, but my experience straight away was when I went there, I managed to get to meet a group of women leaders and, um, I mean, the thing which struck me most was that they said, at one point, one of the ladies said, I mean, you see us, we are about, we are eight women here. In five years, we might be five or four. Mm -hmm. but, but, I mean, we'll, we'll have to do this. We'll not give up. I mean, to, to, to be short, I mean, they're as stubborn or courageous as their as they're men. And uh, we need, I mean, that gave me also the, the thing. They want to organize the, their struggle. And what they need is, is two things. I mean, they need moral support. They need financial support. And then there's another, a third one, which is most important. They said, talk with us. If you think you should come up with a statement, uh, let's say on the Shia law, which, which, which was an issue last year, Discuss with us how the approach should be. Mm. Because if you just do it, it might be dangerous. I mean, it, it might bring gender or women's leadership into the perception of that something of the West, which the West wants to impose on us. 
So the, the most important thing is uh, to bring a national action plan to the stakeholders, which, which, which are the owners of the process in their countries. And as you, I mean, it's exactly the same experience you had. And help them and listen to them and uh, treat them as equal partners because they can teach you a lot. They can teach you, like in Afghanistan, that there are thousands of women who are interested to take leadership roles in their, in their society. I mean, most of us think it's impossible, but they are there, thousands. But they are isolated, and there's, there's nothing to encourage them or to help them a little bit to organize their campaigns, their security, right. et cetera. And, and that part uh, is, is, I mean, there's still a lot to do, and we can do a lot, because they are our natural allies again. Yeah? Yeah, I, I want to build upon the theme of Afghanistan and also mention Iraq. One of the reasons I'm so dedicated to this work is because I've met so many wonderful women from Iraq and from Afghanistan. And in the early days working with Iraq, we had some delegation delegations of Iraqi women leaders over here. It was always amazing to see their dedication and their courage to the cause. And the situation over there was quite violent at the time, particularly as we got into 2006-2007. And often I would see them off at the airport when they were going back to Iraq. And it was just an incredible feeling to think the dangers they're going back into, particularly as activists, not just the general violence, but as activists, as women activists. And uh, one or two that I knew did get assassinated for their activism and for their ties to our country. So you can't help but be dedicated to this cause when you've met with these women leaders. And I totally agree with Milan, and I always quote what she said this morning about the Afghan woman that she saw in her first trip in 2009 who said, please don't look at us as victims. Look at us as the leaders that we are. And that's exactly the case. These are leaders. Their countries need them. We're helping their countries by helping to support them and empower them. And the other point I want to make is men have to be involved, which is another reason I'm involved. But in those countries, men have to be involved. First of all, some of the women don't support the concepts that we're talking about here. In some cases out of fear, in some cases because of cultural background, often more tribal than religious reasons, uh, that they don't support this. You, I've been giving training to people in our government, civilian and military, going out to Iraq and Afghanistan, and I've told them you have to reach out not only to the women but to the men, in, particularly in the provinces you're going to. And there are male defenders of human rights, which means women's rights, in those countries. And there are others who are, you know, amenable but need some persuasion, need some talking to, need some training. So there are lots of people you can work with, and you have to bring the men on board, enough men, the good men, uh, so that this whole thing succeeds and so their country succeeds and so that our politics succeed because in those two countries, for example, this is really crucial, I think, to our national security that we get it right and the people in those countries get it right and are able to build a humane and reasonably, hopefully, eventually, totally democratic society. Yuck, let me ask you to comment on this. I mean, the pillar of, pillars of 1325 involve an equality of, of men and women. It, it involves a seat at the table, at the negotiating table, a real role in post-conflict resolution. How do you get the champions to be the men in societies like the one that you've talked about today that have been through such a traumatic experience? Well, I think there are three important steps that need to be recognized and, and taken. The first is that <laughs> when we talk about including women in peace processes, it's not just to be nice. And it is, uh, it's correct. not to be politically correct. It is the only way to have a sustainable process. I mean, it, it, exactly. it, doesn't, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that it is good for all of us that we have a sustainable peace. And in order to get that sustainable peace, women have to explain what they have experienced in wartime and what they see as the best way to overcome those challenges of the wartime. Because they have the, been the ones who have lived it day and uh, every day. So that is one, one thing that I, I personally try to drive home whenever I speak to people back in my country, uh, government people and ordinary people and my own, um, own family, that improving women's lot is not just for the welfare of the women. Can, can you get the champions that way? Can you turn 
doubters, skeptics, people maybe who haven't even thought of it in this way into champions? It, it needs a second component, which is uh, women's education. Um, I have to emphasize what uh, Admiral Mullen was talking about in terms of girls getting education. I started a girls' school. Well, a girls' school that accepts boys as well. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, the, <laughs> but the idea in oh, principle is that to make this a school where girls learn tools that they can use to challenge the situation themselves so that they are, they are the ones speaking. They are the ones who are agents of their own change. So that when they go home, they are the ones who bring ideas about hygiene to their family. They are the ones who bring home ideas about disease and about the need for them to reach a certain level of education in order to contribute to their families. They are now going home and say that if I finish high school, I'll be able to be employed and I can, I can bring more money than my dowry can ever give you. And they are the ones now challenging the, the, the need to marry them off at age 14. They are the ones saying, if you just wait for me to be 18 and 20, I'll have enough education. And even if that society had decided that the only value of women is to be mothers and to be wives, they will be much, much better at it with some education. And the, it's the women who are now, it's the girls in my school who are now going home and telling the, this story. The third part of it is a lot of a lot of evil is being committed in the name of culture. Uh, that our culture says this and our culture says that. What is the essence of culture if it is not to uh, enable people to adapt to their circumstances? It is, it is of no use to have a culture that does not help you to cope with your environment. So if there is a culture that says Girls have to marry at age 14 and have children when they are still children themselves and have breach and, 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 have, uh, and have obstructed labor and, 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 and die or have uh, other consequences, then it's no longer culture. So what you do and what we all need each other for is to suggest to many communities that it is not against the culture that we are driving. It is making culture more adaptive. And the way to do it is there are people within each culture that are critical of their own culture. Those are the people you want to add your voice to so that there is no accusation of imperialism or of cultural imposition. Because it is basically taking the voices of the people within that community and adding yours to and maximizing that and, and, and amplifying that and as, as, a, as a process to bring change, which will in essence become the initiative from the local people. So, so you're saying... You must find local allies, cultural allies, to argue that the culture must adapt. Indeed. And there are many of people who say this. I mean, some of you remember, uh, may remember the case of a, a Nigerian woman, Amina Lawal, who was accused of adultery and tried and sentenced to death by stoning. Uh, there was a lot of international campaign against this verdict. In the end, it was the Nigerian women who said that, hold on, we have certain homegrown techniques to challenge this verdict. If you come in from outside, everybody will be defensive. They will say, oh, there are these people coming from outside and telling, telling us what to do. Let us come up with our own ways, and then when we have figured it out, we will warn the global sisterhood to help on our own initiative. That is the kind of thing you want to do. Yeah, uh, on, just on that point, absolutely it is up to the indigenous women whose lives are at stake who are taking the chances to dictate the terms of all of this. I remember in Angola when I heard women who were stepping forward and making political statements and realized that they may be at you know, risk of some very awful things, I would call them and say, do you want me to come over and wrap the American flag around you and make it clear that if anybody touches you, the full power and weight of the U.S. government will be behind you. And it was great that George Moose was my assistant secretary at the time because he backed me up on all of that. <laughs> uh, or do you want me to stay as far away from you as I possibly can because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you the target if this is the case. 
And so it is really up to us to let them dictate the terms to us. I think about this a lot in terms of uh, the national action plan that we're going to be developing. It's, it's a bizarre document because, remember, this is not about what the United States will do vis-a-vis -vis women in the United States. Right. It's what we will do vis-a-vis -vis women in the context of armed conflict. And so it's pretty absurd to talk about this being a process that goes on in isolation within our government. We have to look at de bringing in all the expertise from the field. There's a process now going on called twinning, where more and more uh, national action plans are being developed in Europe in conjunction with national action plans being developed in countries that are either in conflict or coming out. We have to do that as well. In addition, we have to use the National Action Plan as a means of developing consensus and ownership within our own government and within our own society. I would have said, you know, one of the key targets of that is the Defense Department, but obviously with, <laughs> you know, Admiral Mullen, he's so far ahead of most of us that uh, you don't even really need to say that. But we do need to use that process as a means of education, as a means of ownership, not only with members of our own government, but with civil society as Jos, well. Jos, would you talk, you have a national action yeah. plan. Would you, would you talk about how that works and specifically how that's changed the way your government is uh, conducting this outreach and, and, and policy? I, I started, I mean, in my last presentation, I, I, I mentioned a few points. I think what we came up, we, I mean, last year we did an, a review, uh, or we thought we, a review was needed uh, because it's, it was too, and we felt it was too ambitious to have 19 goals and, let's say, 81 uh, activities, I think, um, run by different organizations uh, in combination or not. And we felt that we needed to do something. And, uh, again, I mean, that's the, the beauty of the process is that you, f you find out that you can improve your, your process. And what we came up with this year uh, in, Mar in April is that we should focus on one theme. And our theme is women's leadership. Mm. Because uh, most of our activities in the past were on what I would call uh, the two other elements of, of, of gender, which is the rights uh, issue. Women should have their, their rights, their equal rights, uh, mentioned uh, in Constitution or laws and whatever, uh, then if you have the rights in the Constitution and in the laws, uh, let's say the right to education or, or health, do you have a school in the neighborhood where your girls or whatever can go to? That's the access to. The last one is uh, you can receive as beneficiaries or you can be protected as victims, but the last one is uh, uh, women to make it sustainable uh, because somebody who can give you things can also stop it. So you can only overcome it when women are part of the decision-making, so, so the influence element of, of the whole process. So, so that's why, why we said we did too little on, on the, the last part, the influence, the, 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 the women's leadership part. So that becomes our joint effort. And uh, uh, what, what we also felt is, and that's joint, uh, the ambassador's uh, speech maybe, I mean, part of the, uh, the, the strategic uh, focus is, of course, bringing the issue back to the countries, the four countries, and that's a difficult process. But the second one is we have also a role to play in our own country, and uh, not so much uh, in 3025 terms that we should change the, the different, uh, I say, gender policies in the, in the government or whatever, but what I find very much important in these turbulent days, political days, mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, also in the Netherlands we have turbulent, I would say, uh, political changes. No, we, had, we know a little about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is that we need to uh, work on the, on the public support, on the public conscious that this is a good cause to fight for. Are you going to work on the public conscious? I mean, is this country going to sign on to an, an actual formal national action plan, as 1325 calls for? Hillary Clinton announced at the United Nations Security Council last Tuesday that the United States was developing and would sign a national action plan 
I will tell you that there was a buzz of electricity in that room at the council, and I myself got chills when she said it. And and, and when you think about what it will take to navigate through the political process, do your chills become a fever or? I mean, because no, I, I don't. I think you think this can be done. You think this will be done. Well, first of all, it will be done because it is a national action plan for the administration. Yes, we will consult with the Hill. Yes, we will bring the political process in. Yes, we will reach out to civil society. But it is a plan for the administration, so it doesn't require legislation. It doesn't. It, it requires changing the way we do business. But I don't believe that there will be very many needs for legislative fixes. But more importantly than that, I don't think this is a partisan issue. I think there's a broad understanding among all of the activists out there, uh, no matter where they come in the political spectrum, that this, if, if if the 20th century was about race in America, the 21st century is going to be about women. And that's, that's the agenda on, on, on the radar screen. And I'm sorry, I, I, I understand the concerns, but you know, we are ha- the, we're having more women elected to senior positions. I mean, this was a landslide in terms of women's participation in the last election. And I do believe, even though this panel is about how men have to step forward, it is indeed women who are gonna push this agenda you know, I, there, Swanee Hunt, who is a dear friend, has a group called Women Waging Peace, and I consider my, myself the leader of the auxiliary to Women Waging <laughs> Peace, but it's her leadership in this role. Yeah, a couple of points. One, I, I completely agree with Don that we have bipartisan support in this country uh, for these efforts. Uh, when I said that we got $10 million reprogrammed for the Pentagon initially to start up training programs through American NGOs, for Iraqi women, we grew it into a $40 million program from 10 to 40. And the reason was we had uh, sustained support on the Hill. There was an Iraqi Women's Caucus. It was bipartisan, and there were some men in it too. And Iraqi women who came over here always liked seeing the fact that we had some male members of Congress and other men who would support their cause. And I think that helped to build up their courage going going back home. So it's, it's definitely a strong bipartisan or I would even say nonpartisan issues. Secondly, the NGOs are indispensable in all this work. All the work we did in the state went through American NGOs. There are the implementers on the ground. 95% of the training for Iraqi women we did was done by American NGOs on the ground in Iraq who even when security went way downhill did not cut and run, but they kept the programs going. So, so thank God for them. And the third thing I want to say is Don made a good point. How close do you want us to get to you? You know, women in some of these conflict-ridden countries, in, the, in difficult societies with their own internal divisions, you have to be careful how close you get. You give support, you work through NGOs, you work through their own women's network, but you don't want to put a big USA or Netherlands label on it. You want to be careful. And as one of the women activists with an NGO here, a Muslim herself, said, don't overhug. I mean, <laughs> meet with the women see what they want, what their interests are for their communities, for their networks, and try to support this in a very careful, subtle way. Uh, But don't get too close. Certainly don't get any closer than they want you to get. And another related point is where they in their country have a good document or a good plan to work by, work with it because that gives you a good national cover to help them in their own work. Afghanistan has a good law on paper now uh, uh, outlawing violence against women. So the key now is implementation and training all the people, including in the justice system, for implementing it properly because really nothing, you know, very little has been done on that. Afghanistan also has a national action plan for the women of Afghanistan. It's a pretty good document. We can work with that and support it and help to support it, which shows we're serving the cause of their country. So I think these are ways to work it to show that you're with them. You're not trying to impose uh, values from outside. One, One more thing I'd just like to throw out before we go to questions from the audience. Uh, A very important part of this discussion, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, involves and revolves around bringing women into a peace process, Um, giving, providing, assuring a meaningful place at the table 
so that women have voice and the power to bridge conflict to the peace process and to the reconstruction process. And I'd ask each of you, uh, perhaps, to, to think about an example. Is there a, an example you would cite where that has been successful? And what is the lesson that you emerge from that example, if you can think of it, uh, that can provide um, impetus or inspiration uh, yeah. to, to, to broaden that? I, I, personally, I can't think of any oh, no. specific case, but I, but I know why there has not been such cases. And the reason is many of these international or global uh, efforts, starting with the 1994 Cairo Conference uh, on Reproductive Health to 1995 Beijing uh, Conference to now 1325, a lot of women who are suffering from some of these being, things being discussed actually do not even know that these things exist. Mm-hmm. So they are far removed from, 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 the, from the reality of, of things that are being discussed. Um, and those of them who do also have a, a, another problem, and that is they tend to be the elite women. They tend to be the wives of the commanders and the wives of the, of the chairman. And very little connection between them and the everyday women. That is the challenge, which if a, 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 a plan of action is devised, it has to connect uh, to those type of situations in order to be effective, so that it is not just something that is in order for us to be seen to be doing something. Mm-hmm. Don, an example that well, comes to mind? Uh, prob- uh, one of the problems with coming up with examples is you have so many counterexamples. You, uh, Anne-Marie Goetz with uh, UN Women has produce some documentation that shows one out of every 13 people in a peace process around the world is a, women, is a woman. Uh, there have been dozens of agreements that have not had a woman at the table as a negotiator, as an implementer, as a signatory, etc. I would cite uh, a couple of examples of successful uh, integration. Uh, The women vis-a-vis the the, uh, DRC peace process were brought together as a caucus. They did training. They came together to develop a constituency. They went down to the negotiations in Sun City. Regrettably, they weren't allowed into the room, but at least they got to the ante room. And the result was an agreement that was actually pretty good. If you look at uh, Amendment or Resolution 13 of the, of the DRC uh, Constitution, it's about as good a statement of women empowerment and women uh, participation as you're going to find. The problem is taking it the next step, and the DRC is a perfect example. I wanted to make two other points. One is that in many, many of these societies, women are the peacemakers in their local uh, communities. If you look at the Acholi people, for example, in northern Uganda, it is the women who are the village elders who solve the problem, sort of like in, I guess, uh, the Netherlands. Uh, (laughs) And yet, when you then have a negotiation for peace in northern Uganda, It is the government with all men, and it is the LRA with all men who negotiate, you know, who represents the people of of northern Uganda. And again, it's not like they're not capable of taking their skills and expanding them writ large. Uh, Again, I think it's very absurd that Joseph Kony is, like, negotiating on behalf of the people who who he has, uh, you know, pillaged and raped for, for 20 years. The final point is we have to drill down. We have to consider why women are not participating. And there are a number of reasons. Their cultural values, their political values. There are threats that come to women peacemakers that keep even the most courageous women out of the process. Women are expected to play their traditional roles as homemakers at the same time that they're playing a role in the peace process. And so one of the things that we have proposed, and this was before I got into government working with the European Union, was to put together a fund for women's participation in peace processes to give them stipends to pay for not only the hotels but 
to pay for their families to be able to, to continue while they're gone, to pay for protection for them, to pay for training to the extent that they need that to take the skills that they naturally have and apply them to the new concepts at play, and to use that fund for special representatives of the Secretary General when they lead negotiations, uh, you know, in, in sort of track two processes, et cetera. So you have to take it the next step. You can't simply say, you know, let's promote a, a seat at the table and expect everyone to come. Gentlemen, uh, examples briefly because then yeah. I'd like to go yeah. to the audience. Uh, I have, my example is, is on South Sudan. I worked uh, from Nairobi on South Sudan between 99 and, and 2004. Uh, with the women's movements uh, uh, in, let's say, the different political factions as well as in civil society. And um, we changed, let's say, very quickly our approach from supporting uh, individual women to trying to develop, let's say, uh, a, mo a movement that, that you reach the grassroots so that uh, women are not isolated somewhere there, but they represent something. Mm -hmm which needed, again, uh, quite a lot of efforts in terms of, um, let's say, organizational issues. Um, we, I think one of the success factors, I've, I think, and at, at last also the women agree to that, is bringing in a, a professional uh, uh, in terms of financial and organizational management. And we had one of the five uh, big uh, accountant firms to do that. Uh, first of all, because they, they bring real professionalism uh, to these uh, small organizations who don't know how to handle money mm -hmm. uh, and how to implement programs. Um, and second, because they manage to get them within two years onto the level of international accounting, they become, the organizations themselves become, account, how I say, ex they have access to donors. Because if an embassy person sees a project proposal with a Pricewater or Scoopers or KPMG, whatever statement that they can run the money, you have the funds. Right. Yeah. And uh, uh, the third element was leadership training and negotiating tra tra uh, training and content training. I mean, what is the peace agreement or the issues in Sudan? What it is it about? And uh, in the end, they managed uh, to overcome, to bridge the difference between the sudden groups in a way that uh, ended with the CPA, the, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, being signed. I mean, this was not told by the women, but by the, by the SPLM leadership. And um, it ended that in 2005, I think, they were nominated to, uh, for the Nobel Prize for this. Mm -hmm. so, so that's a clear example. It's also that during the negotiating period, at one point they were at 25%. Of the, of, the, of the groups from the SPLM side. Uh, so, so that's one. The second most important example is, I think, Rwanda. And we should uh, have a look into it because if there's one country which, where the government has made an effort to put women and the women themselves had the strength to present themselves in that process of reconciliation mm -hmm. and uh, 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 building up the country again, it's Rwanda. And we should do more research and try to find out what the impact was of having so many women in parliament, so many women in, in decision-making positions towards, let's say, the total stability. And of course, it's still an, an instability over there, but what, I mean, what could, what has the impact been? Just two examples. Well, yeah, briefly, uh, there have been some successes uh, Yosef mentioned 25%. We do have in the Iraqi constitution, in the Afghan constitution, a quota of minimum 25% representation for women in the national parliaments of the two countries and, very importantly, in all of the provincial parliaments uh, because, as Tip O'Neill used to say, all politics is local. So it's really important to work from the local level up. And how about that notion of quotas, if I may interrupt, because that's not something that everybody loves. It's not something we believe in here, I suppose, that we haven't done here. It, 
it was indispensable in those countries in my opinion they would have had very very little representation the old cultural prejudice would have come into play and they would have been blocked out twenty five percent doesn't get you everything you want first of all it should be fifty but secondly some of the women in both countries have been creatures of their political parties they've not been very uh... independent so that has to be worked on interestingly in the last election in iraq uh, all, a great majority of the members of the national parliament were voted out, women and men. And a lot of constituents were saying they didn't do enough, they didn't represent their cause. So you have now a lot of new men and women there, and there's hope in that, there's a potential in that. And again, our NGOs, other Western NGOs, if they do some good political leadership training, you can get to these new people, and I think uh, it's better than some of the older people who didn't do the job. Let, let me let me go to the questions now and, and just I, ask sure. you. Uh, can I can uh, I sure. just real quickly yes. just two quick Sorry. points. First of all, I understand the comment about the concern about quotas in the United States, but please remember, more than half of the countries on Earth have quotas for women's participation in political processes or government. We are not, you know, this is not an aberration. This is the norm around the world. Yep. Secondly, when, you, when you're trying to identify women to participate in these processes, you, you have to look harder. And, and just one point I wanted to make, I remember being in Sudan and spending the day uh, at Afad University, which is this amazing women's university in the middle of Khartoum. It's like a bastion of you know, great thought, and they're graduating thousands and thousands of people out of there. And then walking over to the UN and talking to the special representative and saying, you need to involve, you know, bright, educated women in these peace processes, and him saying, I can't find them. <laughs> and, and me saying, walk two miles that way and you will. Come with me. Yep. Right. Come with yep. me. All right, we've got a, a lot of questions and, and, and a lot of panelists, so I would just ask you, please identify yourself. Keep your question as brief as possible, and we'll move it around to try to mix it up as much as possible. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Marisa Lino, and I now work for Northrop Grumman Corporation, but spent uh, uh, 30 years at the State Department. I just wanted to make one very brief comment, if I may, as opposed to a question. Um, if you can be brief. Yes. I just wanted to point out, and I appreciate this panel, and I appreciate in particular the uh, personal experiences that have been related by the members of the panel, but I just want to point out how far we have come just in my lifetime. In the mid-'80s, I was named uh, as the refugee coordinator in our embassy in Pakistan, and I was the first woman ever to be ha named a refugee coordinator. And the questions were raised at the time, you know, could a woman do the job? And my point was, yes, because I can also, in an Islamic country, much more easily speak to the women refugees. And if you are handing out money, nobody refuses to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Let me come over to this side. Have we got a mic going there? Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Sana Manderlini with the International Civil Society Action Network. Uh, Don mentioned that sometimes we need to talk quietly and other times we need to make a big noise. So I'm going to um, challenge some of the things that, that had the panels have been discussing. Now, I saw you shaking your head back there Absolutely, a bit. <laughs> because I, th I think there are a couple of things. One is that we have in the room with us today Liberians who, who did the peace process in Liberia, a Sri Lankan who walked into the jungle and negotiated a ceasefire, a Sudanese who was in the peace talks, and, and a Chinese who organized 500 women to talk about, to mention peace publicly before anybody else dared to in Aceh. And the problem for their exclusion from the formal peace processes was not their culture. It was not because they lacked training, or, or in that case, one of the questions with training is that do we assume the men are trained? And, and I think that's a real problem in itself. But it wasn't that their, their, their culture was, was blocking them. It was that the Finnish uh, uh, mediators, the Norwegian mediators, and in the case of the Israeli-Palestinians, the American mediators also excluded them. Absolutely. And so it's a political international inertia and lack of implementation of 1325 by the very governments who many of them have national action plans but are not really being proactive on this front. So, All right, let me, let me, let me, I, I, that's, that's so good. I just want to stop you there. Don, respond to that. I agree entirely. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, I, I just recounted the story of the SRSG, 
representing the international community who says, I can't find any women here. Uh, absolutely, we have, we have two systematically excluded women. We have not made this a high priority. You know, there has still never been a woman who has led the negotiation of a peace process from the United Nations, never. In well, the how do we explain that? Well, we, ex we explain well, it because there is a lack of commitment to this agenda in the, in the political leadership. It is men who are appointing the negotiators. We still, I mean, uh, Sanam is a great spokesman, uh, spokesperson, excuse me, for these issues. We, we actually have, sh we served on the Civil Society Advisory Panel for the UN Secretary General on these issues up until uh, a month ago. And she has been making the point very strongly that the United Nations needs to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. We still believe these are soft issues that don't, that, that don't figure in to the actual peace negotiations. Yes, quick, yeah, quickly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I fully agree. I think uh, the main problem or one of the problems is, of course, in our own Western mindset. And when I explained, for instance, the, the, the issue of women in Afghan, Afghan women, being courageous that they want to die for their cause. Uh, of course, you, amongst this, how many think we should try not to have them being killed? Uh, and then uh, if we say, uh, I, would, I told my people in the Netherlands that, I mean, we, uh, do we have a problem that the Karzai government is under threat? And because all of them are under threat of being killed. And we, I mean, there's a slight difference. We feel men can be killed, women can't. And uh, war and peace issues, I think, in our mindset, we feel it's not women's business, at least in the Western world. I mean, in many African countries, women have an, an explicit role in war issues. They have to consent it. For instance, in the southern Sudan, a number of communities have that principle. Women consent if their men have to consent if their men go to war. And they have also the, the role to stop it. That's very traditional, before the English came in. I, I want to move yeah. along because I want to take other questions, but I also, I think I also saw you shaking your head when he was saying that, that the, it's, the, it's the elite women married to elite men, right? You were... <laughs> I, I, that one I can't let yeah, go by. Because, because very often, again, we have people in the room who are not of the elite, and they did it because their sons were killed or because of other personal reasons, and, and this idea that it's only the elite, and even if it is only the elite, so what? If, if the process is to promote peace, why are we excluding them from discussions about peace? No, I wasn't peace? suggesting that they, they be included. I was, say, I was saying that working with them, they have to also realize that they have to have connection to everyday women in order for them to be seen to be, to be fully representative of the views of the, of the, of the excluded people. But if, because there is a tendency for tokenism in, 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 in governments. Mm -hmm. So that if there is a, if there's one woman representing women, regardless of whether she has any relationship with the rest of the women, people will say, okay, fine, well, women are represented, and we, we, we that's it. We, we, are, we are good to go. But I'm saying, when that tokenism takes place, you marginalize people, everyday people. All right, let me come over here. Go ahead with your question, please. My name is Agnes Dimanja, and I am from Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, please be patient with me. Can you speak up just a little bit, please? Yeah. I ask you to be patient with me because the situation of Democratic uh, uh, Republic Democratic of Congo is so bad. We are there to speak in the name of these women there, they can't speak. They can't, they are suffering. They are raped. At this date, there is at least 35 women raped per day at this date, each day in this country. And I thank very much my son, Meduk, for what he said about the destruction of uh, the society when women, uh, African women are raped. And it's why we are today as a stone on your feet.
to speak and again and again about this situation. What is wrong in this, in this country? We heard from yesterday, everyone said we are doing our best for this country. But for us, the situation never changed. This situation is became as a show. Everyone, year after year, we, say, we saw a delegation after delegation uh, go to this country. They listen to these women. They watch these women. But there is no solution. Uh, no one, no act to stop all this situation. And the problem is uh, there is uh, not, not, not only the problem of impunity, is also the problem of the wrong diagnostic. Who are responsible of this situation? From yesterday to today, we never heard about the responsibilities of uh, uh, Rwandan and the Ugandan because when they speak about rebel, there is no Congolese rebel. Everyone knows that uh, these rebels are armed by Ugandan and Rwandan. Okay, I do and not no want to, one, I, I... never, never for these more than 10 years, no one blame Rwandan, no one blame Uganda for what they are doing in Congo. Okay, I don't the want to cut you off, but we have, we have, uh, we have a limited uh, amount Congolese, of time. Let, let uh, me... Congolese, <laughs> Can we, get, can we get a response? Uh, and uh, you Listen. assist to the destruction of uh, the Congolese people Thank you. by let the me, rape let, of let's, these let's women. Let the, let's let the uh, ambassador respond we want to, uh, to okay. see the uh, UN act uh, to stop all this situation. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, ambassador. I'm actually going to very much reinforce that argument. So uh, <laughs> I, I, am, I am very concerned, you know, the DRC is the poster child now, and if you look at the work to pass 1820, 1888, 1889, the use of what was going on and what continues to go on in Eastern Congo was the driving point. And I am so pleased that there's so many people in this room who were part of that effort to raise our consciousness on this. But we have to raise it a lot more. And there are two aspects I want to address. Yeah, uh, or actually just one that is two-parted. It is very important to do the kinds of programs that we're talking about doing in Eastern Congo to address the, the victims of armed conflict, to address the women who have been raped, uh, to address uh, impunity, et cetera. Uh, we have to work with the United Nations to improve the work of the peacekeepers. We have to send in uh, delegations to, in, uh, to investigate and to bring to, uh, to justice those who are accountable. But we also have to look at the policy dimension of these issues. And I want to highlight one situation, which was the decision of the international community to support the action by the Congolese government and the Rwandan government uh, to go after the FDLR in Eastern Congo uh, without having developed any plan for the protection of civilians in that environment. And so the international community, so pleased that uh, Kinshasa and Kigali were finally getting together and getting on the same page, supported the Kamiya 2 operation, which resulted in renegade forces from uh, certainly the DRC government and perhaps both governments raping, displacing families, etc. But it also led to retaliation. And so, you know, it is all great that we're doing all these programs in the Eastern Congo on sexual violence, but the international community's support of that operation led to more victims, more displaced women, more hardship than we could ever have solved with the flip side. So we need not only to look at this as a, as a question of projects and programs, we have to integrate these concerns into our policies. Okay, thank you very much. Here's what we're going to do because we're at the end of our time, but we have some uh, many people still with questions. Why don't we take, uh, take, the, take four questions? We'll go back and forth. I'll write them down. You all write them down. If you can make your questions very brief, 
We'll get comments very briefly back, and we'll have an opportunity to at least um, hear from more people from the floor and get a, a response from this terrific panel. So, ma'am, why don't we start with you? If you could just give us a question, um, we can try to get all these in. Uh, my question is about, my name is Satema Eklai, uh, uh, Director of Programs, Unitarian Universal Service Committee. And I, my question is on education. As we talk about girls' education, uh, we need to ask the following. What type of curriculum are we uh, imposing on the girls? If it is that the girls are only going to school to learn the same old things, it won't work. We also need to pay attention to adult education because it is in these adults that this uh, culture is embedded, and if we don't train them, it won't work. Thank you. Great. One. Number two. Uh, Ryan Harper, actually, it's pretty similar. I was really <coughs> excited about this panel because I wanted to hear about how you're getting men involved in the process, and it's great to hear your personal stories, but I still haven't heard how we get men to listen if we do get women to the table, because getting them to the, the table, if the other people at the table aren't going to bother to incorporate their ideas, you haven't really solved the problem. Great. Number three, sir. Thank you, uh, Anwarul Chaudhary. Um, I wanted to s cite two examples of uh, how to get uh, men engaged in the process very quick. Uh, one was when President Mandela came to the Security Council to brief us uh, on the Burundi peace process. He would say that men would not involve women in the process. So in the evening, the women will come to him share their ideas and thoughts, and next morning we, he will try those out and work. And the men were very impressed by President Mandela's uh, <laughs> <laughs> diplomatic ability. And so at one point he told them that these are the ideas women give me in the evening. Why don't you involve them directly? And that really clicked. Second one, when I was president of the Security Council in June 2000, uh, 2001, uh, I was leading a security council team to Kosovo and I wanted to meet women's group. The Secretary General Spe Special Representative, despite clear instructions to organize this meeting, presented me a program when I arrived there with 15 members of the council. Uh, he said there was no time to meet these women. I said, how about after dinner tomorrow at 10.30? And they said, well, you are supposed to take rest for tomorrow. I said, no, we'll meet. And I did meet the women's group in Kosovo at 11 at night in the hotel lobby. And it was, they are, are still remembering that involvement with the Security Council. Now it has become a common practice to involve. That was the first time a Security Council mission was involved. So I would like to say that the coming situation, the discussions that are taking place in Afghanistan, why don't we involve, invoke 1325 in the strongest possible way. We need to engage the Afghan society in a full way, particularly Afghan women in the peace process there through invoking 1325. Thank you. Thank you. And the last one. Okay, good afternoon. I'm Rubat Ali. I'm representing uh, Gender Concerns International. It's based in Holland. Um, I was... It's, I'm, Kind of very, I have to ask you to I'm be sorry, very, I'm very brief. I'm on the questions that have been asked before. But what can women organizations in these conflict areas do to educate and um, engage men so they can actually listen to them better? Because women are being educated. We're talking about that this whole time, but nobody has talked about, like they said before, how are we educating men, engaging them, for them to listen to us? Because if they don't listen, um, nothing is going to happen. My thank, opinion. thank you very much. We're going to call this the lightning round, guys. And, and let's start with the first question, and, and, and that's education and the curriculum for girls. Yeah, the question was also about adult education. And that, adult education. That it's, Go ahead. That, that it's important to, to, because girls' education is a long term uh, uh, process, while adult education is a short term. And if I bring in the last uh, person, uh, we indeed need to do more about, uh, let's say, civic education, uh, all kinds of, uh, yeah, are you trying to inform and make aware, the population aware of, of, of different things. And sometimes it should be in a smart way, 
with soaps on the radio, whatever. I mean, that's in short yep. term. You want to talk about that quickly? Well, uh, I would ask the question differently about women's education, about girls' education. Um, rather than what curriculum, because the curriculum is going to be the national curriculum. But we, instead of asking the question about the curriculum, ask the question about what, what is the environment in the school that allows for girls to be interested in staying in school and also not fear uh, for their lives because of some teachers who are not considerate because of the distance they walk from home to the school. If the environment itself is not consu- conducive to women's learning, it becomes more important an issue than, 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 than the curriculum itself. Um, man- many minute things that we may take for granted sometimes affect women's learning. Uh, for example, we came to realize in my school, after many months of uh, observing that for a, a two or three day every month, a large number of girls are absent. Absent. Yeah, they're not in school. We are wondering why, why this was happening. We realized that women, yeah. girls, they synchronize when they live uh, menstrual, their menstrual period, and they don't have uh, sanitary napkins. So they don't want to come to school with, the, with their uniform, the only garment they have to their life, and get it stained and be, a, and be, and be teased by boys. And so they stay home. They don't come to school. Something so simple that we can resolve, but we had no idea to know it because the teachers were not trained to be sensitive to some specific and unique needs of girls. Next question. How to get uh, men in conflict areas involved in listening? You've been, uh, we'll be very, very quick. We have two more. Two answers here. First, you force them. I'm sorry. It's leadership. The Secretary General, about four months ago, said, for example, every single one of his, secretary, of his special representatives had to spend one day just listening to the voices of women. And when it was raised to him, you know, why are you doing this? And he said, at the very least, they might learn something. And then they had to report back in the context of the 10th anniversary. So you force it. It's leadership within systems. We'll combine that. Secondly, okay. secondly and, and it is a combined question, you have to make sure that you don't, it's not one woman at the table, two women at the table. Sociological studies show that you need 20 to 25 percent participation. That's the critical mass at which women are listened to, they reinforce each other, they're allowed to talk about issues that don't involve women specifically, but providing their input into other subjects. And so that notion of a quota for women's participation in peace processes, damn it, if the international community is providing billions of dollars to support a peace process implementation, we have the right to demand that that process is going to work, and unless you have women at the table, it isn't. I think that's a combined answer to two. <laughs> an, 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 answer, an answer to combi- combined answer to two and four. Steve, let me give you uh, number three, Mr. Choudhury's question. Specifically, why not three, 1325 all the way in Afghanistan? I totally agree with the ambassador, and uh, his work has been marvelous. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a very tough haul on Afghanistan. I have a friend here from Afghanistan who's a terrific leader, Mina Shirzoy. You can talk to her, I hope, during the break. Uh, we're trying at all levels, and we, I mean American government, the NGO community, USIP, uh, businesses. Uh, we're putting lots of government-to-government pressure on their government about 1325, about women and the whole reconstruction process. Uh, Training has been given by USIP and the Initiative for Inclusive Security uh, to help Afghan women be at the table on every one of these big steps that have been taking part, like that consultative peace jargon. and there were a lot of women there. It was pretty good participation, uh, but it could have been better. We're trying through our NGO uh, training to do this, and I agree an important component has to bring in Afghan men. How do you get them to listen? So I think some of the training I recommend to NGOs is train the women, if it's a women's training program, how to take the training, the message, the information back to the men and their families and communities and get them to support this process and the cause of equality in 1325. And also I think we all need to reach out more to men, get them into the democracy training programs and other programs, and and get them on board this issue because they do have to be made to listen and to come to understand and support this cause. Thank you. And I'm going to take the last word before tossing it back over to you, merely to say 
the world needs more guys like you. <laughs> and, and, yes. And, and, and every, I, I think this was an amazing discussion, a tremendous uh, a, a discussion, a very thoughtful one. But what you have done and, and what you have done from your family to your community and now to taking this to a, to a global stage and the courage that you've shown needs to be conveyed to more men around the world to include this country. So Godspeed and good luck. Thank you. <laughs> back to you. Yeah, I'd like to thank you, Frank, for leading this discussion. I think uh, Donald, uh, Jock, Stephen, Jos, uh, you have shown that you don't become a sissy when you become a champion <laughs> of women's rights. Uh, I think you're all role models, and I think that's the way forward of how to engage men, showing that it can be done. Uh, I'd also like to thank the members of the International uh, Advisory Council of USIP for having joined us uh, at the end of this, uh, this morning. Uh, I am instructed to tell you that your formal program is now come to an end, uh, but we invite you to... Uh, uh, stay with us for the rest of the afternoon. We have some very interesting uh, other panels coming up. We're now going into a break.